Welcome to the Snow Track Perspective Series. This is the fourth and final panel discussion as part of our, our panel series. Um, and today we have six mayors from North and East Snohomish County. So it should be a great conversation that we have. Um, we have about 10 questions that we're gonna go through. So I'm gonna have to limit some of the questions to only a couple of mayors as we go through, um, but we'll try to do it as best as we can. Today here with us, we have Mayor Barb Tolbert of Arlington, Mayor Dan Rankin of Darrington, Mayor Matt Hartman of Granite Falls, Mayor Brett Gailey of Lake Stevens, Mayor Sid Roberts of Stanwood, and Mayor Russell of uh, Mayor Russell Wida of Sultan. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to start with a quick background of SnowTrack for those of you who are new to SnowTrack. We advocate for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation. Um, we focus specifically on the needs of low-income individuals, people with disabilities, older adults, and youth, as well as a series of other priority populations that are key for us. And our speaker series is a way to not only bring together decision makers, uh, but also to make sure that the public is aware of transportation issues, finding out what we're working on, and try to make some progress on that front. So with that, let's get started. Uh, I'm gonna turn off the share function here. And okay. let's do a quick round of introductions. If you could each share your name, what city you represent, and how long you've served, and the top three ways you generally get around. We know probably a lot of you get around by car, but there's probably some other ways to get around too. Um, if you do serve on a local, regional, or state transportation committee, please let us know about it, so that way we know kind of uh, where you're having your realm of influence elsewhere. And we'll start with Mayor Tolbert. Thank you, Brock. I'm Barb Tolbert. I'm the mayor from the city of Arlington. I'm in my 12th year of serving in that position. I serve on the PSRC, Puget Sound Regional Council Executive Board, um, which receives the information from the Transportation Policy Board for final action. Getting around my community, uh, mostly by car, by foot, or, or airplane. <laughs> I didn't realize that, that's new for, that's great. Um, let's next go to Mayor Rankin. Uh, Dan Rankin, I'm the mayor of Darrington. Um, I participate a lot with some of the, a lot of the snow track meetings, um, concerning SR 530 and, and routes up here, um, in East, Northeast County, uh, car, bike, and foot. Excellent. Um, Mayor Hartman. Matt Hartman, Mayor of City of Granite Falls. Um, we changed the form of government in 2016 to council manager. And with that, the council now selects the mayor. They've chosen me since then, since 2016. So eight years as the mayor. Currently on the end of my sixth term as a council member. So 24 years on council and I've got my hat in for one more. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, you got the longest serving council member in the state. Yeah. Um, I don't know about that, but it's, yeah. it's uh, you know, I've appreciated all of that time doing it because truly it, it, you can make a difference. Wow. Um, I get around by walking through town. That's how I look and, and see how things are going. And if I need to leave town, then I have a, a fantastic electric vehicle that I take. That's great. Mayor Gailey. Uh, Brett Gailey, I'm uh, the mayor of Lake Stevens. I've been the mayor for four years. Looks like I'll have another four coming up. And I get around town in my four inch lifted Jeep. I try not to climb too many things along around the city and I as well do some walking, which allows me to use our 
um, Citizen View app to uh, create work orders for public works on lifted sidewalks and trees in the way and they really enjoy and know when I'm going to walk. And then uh, my third way that I travel is uh, Lyft or Uber, uh, depending upon if I'm maybe heading to the airport or something like that. Mayor Roberts. Hi, I'm Sid Roberts. I'm the mayor of Stanwood. Uh, I've been the mayor here two years. I was on the council before that and on planning commission before that. And a uh, little, uh, little known fact is I was also on the city council in Linwood back in when they were planning sound transit and some of that. So, um, uh, yeah, so I'm really enjoying having the mayor here two years and I, I get around uh, by car. I, I'd, I'd love to have an electric car. We don't have one yet. Um, I do walk about to between five and seven to eight miles a day. I've done that for 25 years. And so I'm all over town. People see me. And the third way I like to get around is I like to have my wife drive me whenever she will do that. That's great. Oh, I also, I'm on the community transit board. I should mention that too. Mayor Rita. Hello, I'm Russell Wita, mayor for the city of Salton. I've been mayor um, in my fourth year, uh, running unopposed this year. So four more years uh, coming my way. I served on the city council for four years prior to uh, being elected mayor. Um, don't currently serve on any um, transportation board specifically, although I was involved um, and uh, even though it's not as active right now, the Finnish 522 uh, executive board and effort to secure the funding for finishing the improvements to 522 uh, outside of Monroe. Um, and as far as getting around, uh, around town, I try to walk as much as I can. I live a couple blocks from City Hall, so that is pretty easy for me to get to City Hall, although in the middle of winter when it's raining, I'll admit I do drive a couple of blocks, um, and it's not because I'm lazy. Um, so do do some walking around town, uh, using my car uh, mostly for trips outside of town, uh, and yeah, I've got three bikes in my garage that I never use. So really driving and walking. Um, and yeah, probably if, if there was a third, it would be, uh, yeah, Uber to get to the airport. Well, let's jump into our first kind of substantive question here. And I'm gonna limit this to three of you. So the first three of you to put up your hands will answer the question. Um, in Snohomish County and really across the country, but especially here, we've seen an increase in traffic fatalities, uh, specifically pedestrian fatalities. What are your jurisdictions doing uh, to address traffic violence? I can't find the hand raise thing right now, so I'll just uh, okay, go for it. Yep. So uh, the city has been uh, looking, uh, we just completed our um, ADA, uh, not transition plan, it's the other one, access plan um, for identifying the the current conditions of, you know, our sidewalks, crosswalks, uh, sidewalk ramps. Uh, and so really getting the inventory is kind of the big first step for us. Obviously, the, the next step is uh, the the implementation of those improvements. So we we put some money into our budget uh, every year to make some of those improvements as they come along. Recently, uh, really exciting for us on Sultan Basin Road, where the majority of our, our new residential growth is happening. Uh, we added the flashing beacons for two crosswalks uh, across Sultan Basin Road. And so uh, just within a couple of weeks uh, that we've installed them, uh, gotten a lot of really positive feedback uh, from community members who are already using them and appreciate uh, that they have those uh, options. So those are some of the things we're we're doing to try to improve pedestrian safety. Yeah, thank you so much. Mayor Tolbert. Sorry. 
sorry. Uh, there was a lot of links in the chat and I was looking at that trying to assimilate them. Um, similar to what um, Mayor Rita said, we have, we have developed a trail plan for Arlington to connect our neighborhoods. Um, some of the probably most dangerous places for pedestrians in our city are areas where there is not adequate street lighting or sidewalks or other multimodal ways for people to move around. So we've done an assessment of all of our neighborhoods. We even have done community engagement on that, inviting communities to come in and let us know what's deficient in their neighborhood. We intend to build those into our comp plan as future improvements to look at. And we really look at, we've added some of those pedestrian street cross lighting techniques in some of the, particularly this time of year and then in another week when we lose an hour of daylight, it's really during these dark, challenging weather times or visibility is low that we have to move people safely through our communities, uh, both on foot and allow cars to pass as well. So looking at crosswalks, we did a whole program with our downtown main core of really upping the visibility of our crosswalks with wide red painting across them. They not only made it look good for the city, but it really makes them much more visible to the cars in there. I think it's a challenge that we all are gonna to have to continue to work on. Our communities were built over many years and um, I know my community was first built before for people traversing other than by cars, in buggies, on horses. And so some of the systems that we have in place that we've adapted to use for our car centric community now is probably not the safest for pedestrians. Mayor Roberts, and you're the final one for this question. So. Well, pretty much uh, same, same. Uh, we, we have those new flashing, they're really bright. I mean, you can see them 10 miles away, it seems like, but the new flashing lights. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, as a walker, I, I really appreciate this question because it's not always that safe out there. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've that we're doing is, as you all are doing, is building sidewalks. And we're not just waiting all the time for a developer to do it. We just build a 1500 foot sidewalk along a very busy arterial. And I think in the two years I've been mayor, I've had more people come up to me and thank me for that. I didn't really do much about it, but our staff uh, did it. And, uh, but citizens were, were really clamoring for that safety. Um, and uh, we got it done. And I think it was just a great thing. So sidewalks, sidewalks, trails, lights. And uh, that's kind of what we're doing. Same pretty much as the rest of you guys. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to, we're going to shift gears a little bit from traffic violence issues to transit. Mayors Tolbert, Gailey, and Rankin. Community Transit is planning pilot innovative transportation services in Arlington, Lake Stevens, and Darrington. Uh, such as microtransit, potentially a community van, circulator bus, or uh, investing for Darrington in a flex route service that is currently being provided by Homage. Um, and for those who are not aware, microtransit is basically like a public Uber service where people can hail a vehicle to take them from a point to another point with uh, the service picking up the rider within 15 minutes of scheduling the trip via and app or a phone call. Um, so mayors, what are your hopes for the innovative transportation services pilot? Uh, and what do you think some of the challenges might be? And we'll just go in the order of <laughs> how I listed you guys uh, to begin with. So Mayor Tilbert. Thank you. I'm very excited about this program coming to Arlington. We have a council member who currently chairs the board at CT and has been very involved in helping develop the plans. We received really robust community engagement on these surveys. We have a transit uh, area in Smoky Point, a transit station, but it's not a park and ride. And so that first and last mile is extremely limiting for people who wanna use that uh, transit station to tra travel out of Arlington or to work. The micro transit will, I think, will connect parts of our city that aren't connected by transit or public transportation. There'll be an exponential expansion across the city. So some of our neighborhoods that are two or three miles away from the transit center um, don't have a walkable access to the transit center, another way to drive. And if they drive there, there's no parking for them there. So I think this will solve a lot of pro problems. 
particular, our senior community is very excited about this on-demand service. Um, they are looking for ways not to have to take their cars out into the community to do their errands or to go to their medical appointments. Um, but that, that access isn't there for them right now. Like the other communities you're gonna hear from, we don't have a great full representation of public transit available in our city. It doesn't even connect different parts of our city. It's more in Smoky Point to allow people to exit our community. And there is no way to get people around within the community. And so I hope that it will really help people stay local, shop local, make their medical appointments locally, but also to help uh, the growing workforce in the Cascade Industrial Center. That only transit stop we have until the gold line is here in 2027 is a couple miles away from most of the high volume places of employment. Again, not great walkable areas in this time of year. I know for my fellow mayors who like to walk daily, it was probably a brisk walk this morning um, in that chilly weather. But if you add a little darkness and a little rain to it, it's not a very pleasant way to go. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Gailey, what are you looking forward to? Hey, Brock, good question. Um, so when I was first hit with this microtransit program from CT, I was very excited about it. Um, we have um, a very big geographical uh, boundary in the middle of my city called a thousand acre lake. And it becomes very difficult to do public transit uh, within the city, getting people up to the transit center. So when I saw the microtransit uh, program, I was very excited. And one of the reasons why I'm excited about it is the idea of creating our own pro public transit system within Lake Stevens is daunting and very expensive. And I see this microtransit um, opportunity as the uh, as that bridge uh, capability to get people that last mile, that last two miles around the lake. Um, our kids from uh, the east side of the lake over to the west side of the lake to be able to hit that uh, skateboard uh, skating park um, at a minimal cost um to taxpayers and and to and to those folks as well so super excited about the microtransit uh program and where it can take the city as far as inner uh transportation capabilities and finally mayor rankin yeah so a lot of the a lot of the same things that barb said um it's hard to get around in our town town is only one mile square but and it's a very walkable place. Um, we've done a lot of infrastructure improvements with sidewalks and different things, but that doesn't help with the mobile impaired or our elderly to get from one side of town to the other to do simple things like grocery shopping. Um, microtransit is um, through homage is is doing a really good job at trying to uh, bridge that gap in transportation. Um, getting my community to respond um, and start using um, microtransit is is somewhat you know it's 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 been slow to catch on um, the other aspect which is our students that are latchkey students that um, cannot participate at this time in after school school programs um because the bus comes once a day and uh, or twice a day and does not fit too many schedules um you know being able to get out into the more rural areas where a lot of our um, students live is is another aspect that um we're really excited about uh getting that uh, shored up a little bit more nice. and working with uh, DC connects, uh, Darrington Concrete connects through Soxuato, making that a lot, you know, a little bit more robust. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Hartman, um, it's notoriously difficult to take the bus from Granite Falls to other communities like going to downtown Arlington or to Monroe. You have to go into Lake Stevens or to, to Everett. Uh, to make a transfer and it takes a really long time. Um, what are your hopes uh, for how to improve 
transportation services for our transit in Grand Falls or to and from Grand Falls? Uh, so like pretty much everybody, we have, you know, two types of uh, people who use the bus service. Uh, you get the commuters and they've pretty much figured it out. They've got a bus that comes every morning and, and brings back every night. So they've pretty much got that figured out. It's the people who need the daily services of, of community transit. And they're like, they, they're looking for um, either social services or typically health services that they have to leave town for. Going to Lake Stevens is great because they've got a whole bunch of those services, but that's really the only way to, you know, that's the only route out. Uh, Everett's another option too, but that's even further. Um, I think kind of in a, in a bigger scheme of things, what we've really got is a society that's based on the automobile. And until and unless if to try to break that cycle, um, you know, the legislature is telling us all that we have to grow, that no matter where your city is, you, you, it has to be bigger. So in an outlier city like Granite or even Darrington, there's there's more difficulties with that because there's you know how do you how do you break the reliance on the automobile everybody's going to still need their cars so to me the legislature needs to recognize the effect that they have on some of these outlier cities <laughs> and find ways to fund uh, options and alternatives if they want us to stop driving cars then they need to give us options that are truly viable in order to do that and so truly Brock, what I'd like to do would be to, you know, have a conversation with community transit in the future, once the legislature does allow us for more some some more funding to to talk about how they can get to places like Monroe and Snohomish and, and uh, Arlington. Yeah. Uh, Mayor we, uh, Wida, you have a similar issue, slightly different, uh, but you're on the Highway 20 corridor a ways out uh, with somewhat infrequent transit service. What would you like to see improved? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the the things that I've heard quite a bit about, you know, we've got the community transit uh, that has, you know, regular but fairly infrequent, you know, routes out um, into Salton that, you know, you can get to Monroe and there's a lot of ways that you can get, you know, from the Monroe, Monroe stop either to Everett or uh, even to Seattle. I think that the challenge is, all the transfers that you have to make if you're going to Redmond or Bellevue, uh, which I've got a lot of new residents that are working in Redmond or Bellevue. Uh, a lot of tech workers that, you know, with hybrid work or remote work moved out to Salton because they didn't have to make that commute all the time. And so I know one thing that um, happened a number of years ago, a partnership with, uh, it was, Carnation, Duval, Monroe, uh, some of the other East King County uh, outlying cities uh, was a, a bus that ran specifically uh, along uh, 203 to, to create that connection of East Snohomish County to East King County. So you didn't have to make all those transfers, you know, Monroe to Bellevue to Redmond to, you know, wherever you wanted to go. And so I think you know, some options there. And we're actually looking at um, what some funding opportunities might be uh, really uh, at the beginning stages of this conversation, but to potentially find some funding to expand that option to go even past Monroe um, out to, you know, Sultan, where folks could get on a, a smaller commuter bus to take them to Duval, which then opens up a whole bunch of other opportunities for folks to get where they need to go. Um, I think that the ongoing challenge uh, for Sultan and Granite Falls and Darrington and, and Stanwood, some of these other outlying cities that have smaller populations is, you know, while I think we would all love to have unlimited resources, you know, it's expensive to run big buses you know, all over the place, and we don't have the ridership to justify big buses. And so I think those smaller flexible options um, are, at least in my mind, going to be the most feasible and realistic option for some of our outlying communities. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Let's turn 
next to you, Mayor Roberts. Uh, much is happening in Stanwood on the transit front. Um, there's community transit providing fixed route and DART service, DART paratransit service, and Island Transit and Skagit Transit have routes that connect to Stanwood. Island Transit also has its own microtransit service that it just launched on Camino Island. Um, and a couple of years ago, Snowtrack worked with Lincoln Hill Retirement Community to establish Snow Goose Transit, providing a flex route transit service that connects Camino, Stanwood, and Arlington. Um, it too provides point to point service with prior scheduling, but generally follows a fixed route. Uh, finally, there are business owners who want to bring back uh, what is called the Dinky. Um, an old trolley used to be, uh, you know, steel now, uh, tires. Now they want to have rubber tires uh, running it as a way to uh, promote tourism on the weekends, mostly uh, for visitors and customers. Uh, that's a lot. Um, what do you hear from your community about uh, how they want transit improved and what are your hopes? Well, I think uh, we don't have the micro transit here yet formally, uh, but I, I tell you, uh, Stanwood's an interesting example of transit. You know, we have this uh, community called Camano Island that, you know, you've got to come through Stanwood to get to Island Transit. Island Transit is being very successful in shuttling people around from the island to Stanwood. It's amazing. I mean, um, uh, we see people going from, uh, I, I talk to people at bus stops about, you know, what's happening and uh, I, I'll go to a bus stop and think they're a community transit uh, rider and they're island transit rider and they're, they're going to the grocery store and back to other places and, and you're really using island transit uh, a lot. Um, the other thing, you're, you're right, Snow Goose Transit is another uh, sort of smaller but very busy uh, hauling people all over Stanwood and out to Camino. I mean, they're, they're just, I know Community Transit uh, donated one of their uh, vehicles to them, and I think they're wearing it out. I mean, I, I see them everywhere and all the time. Um, as far as uh, uh, Dinky, I don't think Dinky's coming back as a real viable uh, transportation uh, element. Uh, I, I do hear from uh, citizens, however, that, that are liking uh, the opportunity to ride a nearly express bus out of Stanwood to get uh, several places south, including Linwood. So I think what we would really like to see at some point is not necessarily a, a new green line or gold line or that kind of thing, but uh, we are seeing uh, a lot of people moving to Stanwood. They have high speed uh, fiber here now, and there's folks that, that work two or three days from home and need to commute in. And so I, I think you know, uh, it seems to me that, that making connections, too many connections is, is one of the real killers of people riding transit. And if we can make those sort of direct routes, and uh, I was just speaking with a citizen today who, who rides to Linwood and was very happy about his experience. So uh, yeah, there's a lot happening. Uh, we, we do have uh, uh, two downtowns. I think there's a question. We did have two downtowns, two cities really. I think there's another question here that I can, Hit on that, but no, it's it's really happening. There's a lot of uh, people being moved around in Stanwood. Great. Uh, this next question is for Mayor Tolbert. Uh, the region is investing in high capacity transit, not just light rail, but also bus rapid transit. For example, Community Transit is planning a swift gold line that will connect Everett Station through Marysville to Smoky Point. Um, and you know, in addition, the Puget Sound Regional Council's regional plan, Vision 2050, calls for 65% of the region's residential growth and 75% of the region's employment growth to occur within a half mile of the rail stations and a quarter of a mile of the bus rapid transit stops. Um, what opportunities will this expansion of high capacity transit bring to uh, Arlington? And what is your jurisdiction doing to capitalize on that opportunity? Well, they're being the opportunity to have people live closer to public transportation. Um, and hopefully that will increase the numbers of people who utilize it. Like Mayor Hartman said, we're a very car centric um, society. We have built for decades our communities to be slaves to the car and the truck. And um, it is going to be a transition period of time in my mind for people to move away from that and feel a trust in using public transportation that they can still 
have an efficient way of getting from point A to B in a timely manner. So how we build out these transit systems are gonna be very important that they have uh, that connection to how people actually intend or would want to use them so that they can be intentional in that. I think we're very excited to get the gold line. I met with a very large employer last week with community transit in Arlington who found out after all the work to build here and uh, upwards of 1600 employees, their employee schedules don't match the public transit schedules. So they have, you know, 10 to 12% of their workforce who can't even get to work from Darrington to Arlington on a weekend through public transportation. And so our planning has to go much further. We need to bring the private sector into it as well. You know, so companies can align their shift schedules around the availability of public transportation. And I feel like a lot of people sit back and wait for transit agencies to come up with an idea and a plan and tell us how it's gonna be funded and what it will be run. And I really think the opportunities are to make this a much more engaged process and more complete with more people at the table, more companies thinking about transit schedules before they set their work schedules, if that's all possible. These aren't easy changes for anyone to make, but I think that they have to be more robust in that. Um, so I think there'll be some opportunity for us to team that up with some miss, missing middle housing which we're very much in favor of here in Arlington. We'd like to see those entry points into home ownership for new home buyers. Um, and hopefully that will help, but there's also a big requirement on the cities. We're already planning for redevelopment of the Smoky Point Boulevard, you know, and what that would look like to be a multimodal. And we are surrounded in Arlington on all four sides by state highways and the interstate. So we are completely dependent on our state partners acknowledging the transformation that has to happen. These two lane state highways don't have bus pullouts. It's impossible and dangerous to put transit stops on these two lane highways that have 24,000 traffic movements a day. And so we really would like to see the state engage as a full partner in some of their old state highway roads that served a purpose for a very different community than what Arlington is now. And I bet the other mayors could say the same thing for state highways that run through their jurisdictions. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go back to Mayor Roberts here, uh, away from transit and more to like our streets. Um, you do have a project called the Twin City Mile, which aims to revitalize your two downtowns or former cities that comprise Stanwood um, and the street that connects the two of them. Tell us more about the, the great project that you have. Well, yeah, Stanwood uh, was the original Twin Cities, right? I uh, mean, uh, the twin Norwegian uh, hamlets here. Uh, we, we had uh, West Stanwood, which is down the floodplain, and East Stanwood, which was more... Uh, on the east part of town and kind of up on the hill. And they served, uh, were, were separate cities until the 60s when sewer brought them together. Now, I would like to, it's a great thing to bring a town together, right? They couldn't move together until they needed sewer. But anyway, they got it figured out in the 60s. And it just turns out that our, our main street is a mile long and from two new little parks we were in the process of putting together little neighborhood parks and so we we named that the twin city mile and uh basically we're you know we already had you know all the right away and all the sidewalks and all that was already there uh, and you know it's funny we're, we're kind of off topic there's still a little bit of a division between the two towns i mean it, they've been one city for 50 or 60 years and we, if we light the do a tree lighting in east stanwood that, you know, they're bothered that we didn't do it in West End and all that. So anyway, the Twin City Mile is is an attempt to try to, you know, recreate uh, our city um, and bring the two towns together and, and just, you know, infrastructure and all that. So it's happening. It's a big project. It probably stretch out over 10 to 20 years. It's grant dependent, of course, on a lot of stuff that we need to do. We, we just did uh, rebuild some sidewalks and some intersections and put up a new uh, arch welcoming, welcome, welcoming people to town. So it's a, it's a long-term project and we're really excited about it. Nice. Um, I think that's a, a very discreet project that's very nice encapsulation of revitalizing a downtown. Mayors Hartman, Gailey, and Rita, uh, 
I think your cities are also focused on similarly uh, building out the infrastructure for a better downtown. What are your cities doing to revitalize your historic commercial centers to not just make them more attractive, but also make them places where people with disabilities, older adults and youth can safely, comfortably and joyfully walk, roll and bike uh, to the jobs, shops, services and friends' homes that they wanna to get to. Uh, and we'll start with Mayor Hartman. Um, granite, like Darrington, is not very big. So it's it's fairly a tight commercial uh, property downtown. There's a couple of senior centers that are very close or in downtown. And then there's the larger one that's just a couple of blocks away. So the city itself is very walkable. We have a blinking red light in the middle of town that stops everybody. So there's ways to get across the street, even if you're slow. Um, there's there's options for people to get around. The city's made a number of strategic real estate investments over the last few years to purchase like an old church that was pretty run down. And we we raised it, we, we, we tore it down, and now it's an empty lot. So we have a number of different lots around town, including the downtown area, that, that have multi-purpose um, possibilities. And so we're weighing those options to find out what's the best idea. We, we really like the idea of walkability. And so the museum has, has a, an app that you can in, install on your phone and, and it'll walk you around town to various places, showing you different items of interest and old buildings and that kind of thing. So if in some of these strategic lots that we've purchased, we put some park benches or picnic benches so that people can go to the restaurants, get the food to go, sit outside. This is of course in any month that's not, you know, raining and cold, um, then that will give people a lot of opportunities to get around town. Fantastic. Mary Gailey. Yeah, um, so when I think of Lake Stevens and and what your question's referring to, I have to kind of think of two different areas. One's the, our downtown, like old Lake Stevens. And um, we have been working on that sub area plan for the last uh, several years with the renovation of North Cove Park, with the addition of Millspur um, Community Center. Um, we, this next year, we'll be using some TIB funds to, um, uh, redo the rest of Main Street from Mill Street uh, south to 16th. That will include uh, better pedestrian walkability, lighting, um, just be a little bit more inviting uh, section of Main Street. And then on the north side of, um, of Main Street, where it runs into 20th Street and onto Hartford. It's really right now, really literally just an ankle buster place to try to walk. And um, we were able to garner uh, $2.5 million uh, from uh, Federal Earmark uh, for a roundabout in that space. So um, we'll see a new roundabout go in there that also will go in conjunction with a new development and uh, possibly a new fire station remodel that will completely change north of 20th and make it much more walkable and easier for pedestrians to, to get around downtown uh, and to accommodate uh, additional new pedestrians in that area. The other section of the city that I think about on that question is Frontier Village. It's funny, you know, people will think that Frontier Village is downtown like Stevens and actually isn't, but it is a major commercial area of the city. And uh, uh, if you've been through Lake Stevens, you know that uh, we have just accomplished uh, with partnership with WASDOT, uh, the uh, creation of one, two, four, five-ish roundabouts in that area, right? And has created uh, really an interesting um, master's level capability of driving through roundabouts. And, uh, but I like them, I love them. And uh, one of the things that that has created is the ability for people to walk uh, east and west across Highway 9. And and uh, and it's still vetting itself out. People are still learning their way through it. But what that does for us as a city is 
originally that design was meant to be an underpass, which would have meant Matt, instead of uh, stopping in Lake Stevens to buy stuff, would just drive through Lake Stevens to get to Granite Falls. And we don't want that. We want Matt's money. So um, so it, it really creates a better atmosphere for our businesses, uh, the, the ability to walk through that area, as well as uh, the capability of vehicles uh, to transit through our commercial area as well. Nice. Mary Wita, I know you've got things going on, especially with Highway 20, so... What do yeah, you have? Highway Two. Yeah, Highway Two. Highway. I said I keep saying a little, Highway Two. A little further north. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, like Brock said, Highway Two is is kind of the uh, the the major talking point thing we hear concerns about is you know all the all the mayors on the call are in the process of of leading comp plan updates and so. You know, we're all doing public outreach and the highway is the number one thing that that we heard about. Um, that's nothing new. Um, Mayor Gailey joins a chorus of of my constituents every winter uh, to let me know how bad traffic is uh, on the weekends uh, as he's driving through. And so, you know, the, the city really took um, a leadership role a couple of years ago as it related to the highway. Um, as far as putting a plan together for improvements. Uh, a lot of things had happened at the state over the last few decades that just kind of seemed to, conversations came up, a plan got put together and a plan got put on the shelf. And and we, you know, thought that we needed to, to really be leading the conversation to get something done. So a couple of years ago, we uh, commissioned a, an analysis of some alternatives for the highway, uh, did a bunch of public outreach on that. And, and essentially what we landed on, which was the, the consensus from community, uh, local agencies, uh, business partners and others is replacing the lights with roundabouts uh, and then also adding, adding the lanes um, for for that access on and off the highway and, and through town. And so we're currently in the process uh, of designing uh, with PSRC funds a roundabout at Main Street and US2. Uh, it's over by the old Dutch Cup uh, Hotel. And um, you know that's a big access one for us because that's the entrance to Main Street for a lot of our folks on the east side of town. And so making that access on and off uh, US2 uh, down to our main street is really important. And we kind of have two main streets. We've got, you know, our our main street that's off the highway. That's where a lot of our businesses are. But the highway is more or less, you know, a main street for us um, because it's the the main way through that you get through town. And so uh, I think roundabouts are going to help. We're going to have more access for people to get from one side of the highway to the other, um, uh, both in cars and out of cars. And one of the things along with that plan that we're doing and kind of looking at that complete streets concept of making sure there's abilities for, you know, all methods of transit, uh, we've got another grant that we're working on that would create a pedestrian path on the south side of the highway and actually be detached from the highway because that's something we always think about is safety, right? You've got cars, you know, moving at 35 miles an hour. And so this pedestrian path would connect the new pedestrian bridge that we have um, run under the highway and then uh, between the, the railroad tracks and the highway for bikes and, and walkers and, and other folks uh, that aren't using cars. And so that would connect to one of the intersections with a roundabout and allow folks to get back across town. So uh, on the highway, a lot of work happening there. Wash dots moving forward with some existing funding. Uh, on a roundabout at Fern Bluff Road and Highway 2, uh, which is a, you know, one of the main intersections that causes a lot of the congestion and safety issues. So uh, we're excited about that. We're glad to have taken taken the lead on that and see things actually coming to fruition. Um, that's obviously going to be a long term project uh, because none of the improvements get fully realized until two bridges get replaced and uh, bridges are big and expensive and uh, very challenging. So, but we're we're moving forward on that. And really excited on the the main street kind of downtown um, improvements. We've 
uh, undertaken a couple of initiatives over the last couple of years uh, related to that. We started with a downtown visioning process where we went out to the community, to the business owners, uh, and said, you know, what do you, what would you like to see, uh, big picture downtown? What amenities are missing, um, both from businesses as well as infrastructure, uh, and then took that and did a partnership with the University of Washington Storefront Studio program, uh, which really took our downtown, took that feedback we received from the downtown visioning and said, what could this look like? And so that that produced a booklet uh, that had a, a number of, of things for us to consider, both from facade improvements for businesses, uh, different seating and aesthetic improvements to city rights of way. Uh, there's a city owned parcel downtown that the, uh, we're kind of up in the air on what to do with. And that came up with some ideas for a downtown park, a uh, place to host food trucks, events, concerts, uh, additional parking, because that's something that we we also realize is at the same time that we want to make it more pedestrian friendly uh, and have people be able to walk, uh, as multiple of my fellow mayors have mentioned, we are a car centric society uh, that's not going to change overnight. And so making sure that if we're successful at filling all of our storefronts, we need to make sure we've got parking um, so that they're accessible for folks. And so looking at options to to have more parking as well. So uh, we've utilized and will be utilizing in the next year or so uh, some of our ARPA funds uh, from the federal government to implement some of these changes. And, uh, you know, really just a lot of a lot of moving parts on this but it's it's really exciting to be in a place that we can actually be uh not only creating plans um but implementing them so they don't just sit on the shelf and collect dust like many plans do thank you uh i think this will be a final question before i try to open it up to q a to the audience here so i'm queuing the audience to think of your questions and uh, be ready to raise your hand and come on screen to ask them. Um, so uh, all of you are in the midst of starting to do a major update to your city's comprehensive plans. You have to get them done by the end of 2024. One of the elements of a comprehensive plan is the transportation element. What transportation policy changes are you most interested in? Are you looking to shift um, from a you know, we've had what's called a level of service approach towards uh, traffic um, uh, design, and the state's now requiring us to do multimodal level of service approach in terms of designing our streets and what we put obligations on developers. What are you looking on on that front? Um, also, there's, you know, new best practices on complete streets. Are you looking to update your complete streets policy? Uh, Mayor Weta brought up parking. Um, there's been a movement towards reducing parking minimums within new development and in order to support transit-oriented development. Are you looking at doing that? Are there other policy changes you're looking at? And I'm just the first three people to raise your hands, first mayors to raise your hands will go. And we'll start with Mayor Gailey. Hey, uh, a couple of things we're working on at Lake Stevens and I, that I would like to see some incentives to get based on. One is they, uh, um, we've partnered with the uh, city of Marysville to do a Bayview connector trail uh, that would connect um, West Lake Stevens underneath the Power Lines Trail onto Marysville's Bayview Connector Trail, and that would end up eventually up in uh, Wonderful Barb's area, and um, as well as the Centennial Trail. Um, it's going to be a great opportunity for a multimodal uh, kind of path in that area. So we're 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 working on the designs for that, and and that is in the comp plan. The other thing I'd really like to I'd like to see some some help from our legislature on this and creating incentives for um, transiting where you live sorts of projects or transit oriented development. We have we have a great um, CT has a great transit center right in the middle of my frontier uh, village commercial area, and I would love to see the opportunity to do a mixed use. Uh, transit, live where you transit sort of project above that, what is now just a parking lot. You know, pre-COVID, that parking lot was full. It was, and now we're probably maybe at 60%. 
And uh, I think it's just a great opportunity, but I think there needs to be some incentives somehow to create a project like that where we can go, you know, five stories up above where we're currently parking for transit and let those folks um, who use transit a lot live there and um, jump on the bus and get where they need to go and also walk across the street and have a mod pizza or get their makeup at Ulta or whatever it is. Um, but we need to get some sort of incentives out of uh, the state to get those sorts of programs going uh, here at Lake Stevens. Well, I wanted to throw out one more thing that wasn't brought up earlier on your earlier question um, about traffic violence. You know, one of the issues uh, that brings that comes to my mind on that is our lack of police officers. I think it, most of our mayors can say that if if we've been taken away from our police officers, it's on the traffic police officer side, the traffic officers. So I think you uh, trying to somehow uh, figure out how we can get more more police officers to actually get hired and brought into our our departments would help us implement traffic officer programs, which would help reduce uh, our fatalities and, and issues with pedestrians on the streets. Excellent. I, um, regarding the trail, Powerline Trail, I'm all excited about it. I did go on a trail run, so to speak, uh, a while ago, and uh, I attempted to go on most of the Powerline Trail. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hilly and a little rough uh, and the soil is not great condition, but, uh, but, but so. we're getting the first phase knocked out this summer. So, so you won't get all muddy the next time you're running. Very good. All right. Uh, Mayor Tolbert. Um, thank you. So we have been shifting away from the uh, level of service designs into more multimodal designs. And I would Caution my fellow mayors, you know, it's a, it's a wealth of opportunities, but it also provides a wealth of challenges as with it as well. It, you can't, can't look at North Snohomish County and not acknowledge that it's been a car centric or a truck centric communities for a very long period of time. They're built that way. And, you know, as there are still central services, our, our citizens need that are located in Everett. And there's not a robust transportation system that will get them to Everett and back home. In, in a reasonable amount of time. We, ha we have a complete streets program that we developed two years ago. We're very pleased with it, um, where we've been able to implement it. Um, and now we look at that with all the new development that comes to the community too, for those traffic impacts that they will have to comply with the complete streets program, which puts a total multimodal use on it, um, on those as well. Regard, the one thing I wanted to say was about the reduced parking minimums that come with that. And, you know, we'd really like to see transportation policy that gives communities like ours and the other mayors that are here a time to work into that, a time to convince people that they can rely on public transportation, that it will be there for them, that it will be accessible for them. That's when we can begin to reduce our parking minimums. Um, I think in places we made the mistake of reducing when we put our mixed use overlays of reducing the parking minimums a and the, the pushback from it was horrendous. I mean, people weren't ready <laughs> yet to give up their cars in a community that doesn't have robust public transportation or options for people. And I just will have to say, you have to look at the age of the different sectors of your communities. Not everybody is going to be able to walk to places like most of us here can. And so it's, there's, there's some real challenges coming forward with this. And as we look at the Vision 2050 and some of the changes that it's putting on transportation, there's a robust amount of money coming from the federal highway monies in the next two years for the 26, 25, 26 funding cycles through the Regional Transportation Organization. But there's also new requirements and how those grants will be scored. And congestion relief is no longer um, of interest really to the transportation planning organizations because that qualifying scale of how it qualifies for uh, carbon emission reduction is not as highly scored as it was previously. And so there'll be challenges for communities like ours. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Rita. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and uh, Mayor Tolbert was was touching on this, you know, towards the end of her remarks, but I think the the important thing to to remember is not all communities are created equal. 
Um, we, we have different challenges and different needs. Um, on the, the reduced parking, uh, the, you know, as we've seen most of our development be single family residential developments, um, the, the need for more parking um, is, is critical. And we've actually updated some of our uh, local residential developments um, to require more parking because these developments were getting put in without uh, adequate on-street parking and people just have more need than than was being allowed for. So then you end up with all sorts of issues where people are parking too close to mailboxes, too close to driveways, too close to intersections. Uh, it creates a lot of discontent within neighborhoods because you've got some people that flaunt the rules, some people that follow the rules, uh, people calling in their neighbors and their friends on you know parking violations. I don't have the staff resources to go out there and tag every car that's parked, you know, not according to to the rules. And so, you know, recognizing that there's there's differences within communities um, and without adequate transit options, I think it's a fool's errand to try to force people out of their cars. If we had a robust transit network that went through all my neighborhoods and got people connected to reasonable options for transit, okay, you know, that's great, but we're not there. And the state's not telling me that we can slow down growth until those transit options are there. They're telling me I need to do it now. So I think that's that's one of the challenges with, with some of these changes in transportation policy is that it doesn't necessarily recognize the different needs uh, of the different communities. So, so I think that's, that's important. And, and the other thing is, you know, to the, the issue of, you know, congestion relief, not scoring as highly and, and, you know, some of these different things I had as part of our outreach we did for us too, I had a lot of state legislators in my, in my community, uh, from different parts of the state talking about the needs. And I was, astounded at some of the ideas that they had about transit being an option for people who wanted to go camping over in Chelan. I mean, I don't know how many folks on the on the call, you know, have gone camping, but I don't see packing a tent, sleeping bags, cooking things and everything else onto a bus so you can go camping on Lake Chelan for the weekend. So we will need cars. The idea that we're not going to need cars, I don't think is operating in reality. So I think the the really comes down to balance. And I, I don't think it's fair to 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 push those needs aside um, as we look at, at transit options. So I think those are some of the, the challenges. And, and in, at least in my opinion, I think the pendulum has swung way to one side. Um, and I think we need to find a good balance. If mayors, if you have time for five more minutes, I'd like to at least give one audience member an opportunity to ask. I will, while folks are thinking of your question, audience members, please do just raise your digital hand uh, or come on screen. Uh, I'll note one of my favorite hiking trips of all time was taking Amtrak from Seattle to uh, Mount Vernon. I got picked up by a friend and driven up to uh, the Cascade Pass trailhead. And um, went over the pass, uh, camped uh, down at the far end of Lake Chelan, and then um, took the, the boat across, got dropped off. My parents picked me up, went to a family reunion, and then they dropped me off at another trailhead. I hiked over to Leavenworth about 30 miles in a day and then caught Amtrak back. It was really fun. Um, I encourage everybody to do it. It's not for everybody, obviously, but I do encourage you to do it. It's a great way to, to do it. Um, Thank goodness anybody... your friends and your parents had cars to get you. That's true. Life. That's true. I would have done it, though. I could have done it all by myself. I just had to spend a week with my parents, so might as well did that. Um, all right. There is one question in the chat. I'm going to ask it, and then we can go from there. Uh, so... Todd Welch asks, obviously there's rural communities, they have, uh, we're trying to provide better transit there. Um, there's 
you know, there are probably about 25% of your residents in the rural communities that can't drive because of age, ability, or just uh, low enough income that they can't just have access to a vehicle. Um, but obviously lots of other people just live there for their rural identity as well. Uh, and it's very expensive to provide transit on a per rider basis. So uh, how do we balance those needs in the rural community? And I'll, I'll take two mayors if you wanna answer and then um, we'll, we'll wrap up here. I'd love to answer that. Yeah, hi, Mayor Tor. I think, I think Mayor Wida alluded to this. We tend to look at transportation as a one size fits all. Um, the same way we're looking at growth and planning that comes down to our communities and the dictates that we get. Um, so we have some, in our region, we have some very big, very congested, dense cities that are in our region and public transportation in those systems, in those cities are quite different than it looks like in the rural areas. And Todd's not wrong. People move to the rural areas because they, they move there, I think, fully knowing and being aware that they're going to be in a more car-centric car place, that they're going to have to travel longer distances to services and things that they need. And so there's an expectation with that. The question that we all have, or at least I have, is, you know, how do we affordably prepare our communities for a more dense future when there will be more public transit operations available for our residents, but allow the residents who are living here now able to keep the same quality of life they think they have. Um, and that includes getting around quickly by their cars. You know, I don't think I, I, the places I've taken public transportation, I love taking a train a long distance or a bus for a long distance, but on shorter hops, just to get some things done from my community, it's not an efficient way to travel. And so if, if I had all the time in the world, um, to be able to do that, it would be one thing. So how can we look at planning out a region, putting some equity across in the funding that so forth that recognizes the regional differences of our populations and what their expectation is and what are the regional differences in our built environments? Rock, if I could make a quick comment too, yeah. uh, just to kind of go back to something that Mayor Weida was saying and kind of uh, what Mayor Tolbert is saying is I think we have to take in consideration truly the demographic differences of our cities, especially, you know, when you're talking about parking, I mean, we have a, a new development in, in Stanwood and I, I tell you uh, about half of the homes not just uh, have pickups, but they're not just like my little Tacoma pickup. I mean, they're, they're the big, you know, a, a six passenger, like 20 feet long pickups. And, and uh, that's a demographic issue. There are people that, that move to the smaller, or to the rural towns that have that kind of mentality. And they're not thinking in terms of uh, electric vehicles so much. And so I think we do have to just sort of balance, um, you know, uh, all of that when we're looking at and the one size fits all uh, mentality. And so people move to rural communities uh, for different reasons. And I just think trying to, for, you know, for instance, uh, you know, uh, put uh, metro traffic, traffic or parking requirements on, on a, a city like at Stanwood or Darrington or Sultan just doesn't work. And, and so I think just finding that balance as a, as a county to get people where they need to go is uh, the, right, the right approach. Right. Well, thank you all mayors for a great conversation today about transportation issues in Snohomish County and how each of your communities are addressing them and thinking about them for the future. Uh, I hope those who attended found it uh, really interesting and enlivening. Um, we will be posting it to our YouTube channel for others to be able to see in the future uh, so others can see it and be sure to share it out. Um, we don't yet have a next event. We do have a snow track partners meeting in November. Um, feel free to go to our website and join that meeting to uh, hear what's happening. Uh, we will have uh, Snohomish County Public Works there presenting on their priorities uh, for the coming year. Uh, so that should be an interesting topic uh, to hear from as well as a couple of community-based organizations that are trying to support transit-oriented development, equitable transit-oriented development uh, in South Snohomish County. So 
Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Bob, for the work thank that you, you do. Appreciate it. Looking at trans benefits the small communities. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor.